Welcome to the last seminar workshop of today's dance fair. We are going to talk about DJing, real DJing, and we're going to do that with one of the most technically skilled DJs I know. A warm welcome for Laidback Luke. Check, 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 check. Okay, okay, coming in. So yeah, I um, thought it was very important to do this workshop and get something going within the new generation uh, about the real art of DJing. I feel nowadays uh, people tend to look, look over the art and um, the real art is such a wonderful thing and it has such a long history and it's more than standing on top of the DJ booth with your hands up and making an awesome jump for the camera um, and have the pyros and confetti out of it. There's so much more. And um, the real art of DJing is why I have been DJing professionally over 15 years now, and it keeps me going. Um, so once, I think Dead Mouse uh, said, you know, he compared me with other DJs and he thought, a lot of DJs are playing it safe, whereas I'm like a rally driver. And I like taking turns and like going through the dust. And um, this is what keeps me passionate about DJing. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, my history in DJing, what my influences were. I'm going to tell you a little bit of um, how I prep my sets. Um, I'm going to tell you about um, the way I mix and select my tracks, I think is, is, is a very important thing. Um, and, well, so, uh, last but not least, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about DJ technique. So, don't get me wrong, this seminar is not about, like, scratching or, like, being an, an amazing turntablist. Um, real DJing is not about that, and it didn't start like that. So, actually, we used to have a lot of DJs that, uh, you know, were just able to beat match um, with the vinyl decks. And they were legendary names, but sometimes you could even hear them making mistakes. Um, and it was amazing because you would listen back to their sets and you would think, oh, is he going to correct it? Is he not going to correct it? Oh, he's getting it. Oh, no, he lost it. And this was such a, such a special vibe. So um, a few of my influences, some, some Dutch names, uh, which I want to throw up here because we're in the Netherlands and they've influenced me a lot. Um, so, for instance, uh, DJ Remy w used to... Who knows DJ Remy around here? D does anyone know DJ Remy? Okay, so he's a legend. He's the guy that actually signed me to my first agency in the Netherlands. And he used to be known as the tightest DJ around. So that doesn't mean he was tied up in his ass. It means <laughs> he was tight on the decks. And um, um, he could seamlessly mix tracks. Like, so uh, a set would sound like uh, one track of uh, two hours long. Um, so uh, that influenced me uh, at first. So whenever I started DJing, I would listen to his sets. So he came from the corner of like Sasha and Digweed, where it was just seamless mixing. So now I just want to do a seamless mix for you, so you know I can do that stuff too, because you always see me like bang, 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 bang. So let's just do a seamless mix for you. So this is, this is actually very boring to me, do, do a seamless mix, but I'm just going to show you.
So yeah, anyway, if this would be my career, and if I would do this like 15 years long, I would be really bored behind the decks. But um, so this used to be like the thing. And I guess in Deep House and in techno, this still is the thing. But to be very honest, I can like live and breathe with beat matching. So you, you saw me uh, beat matching actually with my hand on the pitch. So I don't look at the, the BPM markers because somehow, magically, uh, within all these years of practice, my, my hand just, whenever I hear like a mistake, I just, my hand actually corrects it. I don't need to think about that. So that was one of my first um, actual um, developments as a DJ to mix seamlessly. Now, uh, there's another Dutch DJ that influenced me. He's, uh, his name is DJ Pear from uh, The Hague. And he introduced me to what I call power mixing. So he was mixing, he was doing this seamless mix, and all of a sudden, um, you know, he would, he would mix, and this, this would go on for like one and a half minute, and you would be like, oh yeah. And all of a sudden, he bam, he turned, he turned the bass on, and I was like, whoa, this is like a whole new level of energy he's bringing here. So wait, so this is like a power mix. So he's mixing, mixing, and then instead of like seamlessly flipping the bass, he like chucked the other bass in, and this was a revelation to me. I, uh, uh, being on the dance floor, I wanted to dance so much harder to that. Um, then came Miss Monica, who's from Rotterdam. Who knows Miss Monica around here? Come on, Rotterdam, where you at? Um, so Miss Monica combined the power mixing with a bit of scratching. Like, all of a sudden, I heard like, wait, what am I hearing now? Like, she's grabbing the record, and she's pulling it back, and like she was doing more tricks. What I heard in Miss Monica's set was she had a string session at a certain point. So she was mixing vinyl, she had a string session. Usually when you correct a string session, I don't know if I have a, like a string here, let me... This is a tricky thing, sometimes DJs go on after me and um, they, they forget I don't play with the master tempo on, so... So they'll, they'll start correcting the track they're about to mix and you'll be hearing this. So back in the day with vinyl, we didn't have master tempo. So how would you correct a record that had like a string session and you were going, going wrong? So this is why I developed like mi mixing with the pitch. So you can actually like correct without having like the the, you know, the mistakes in there. Miss Monica taught me that. Um, other artists, um, oh, Frankie Bones, man, Frankie Bones was something else. So a lot of times people think my roots are in hip hop, uh, which is not. My roots are actually in uh, like house music and techno music. Frankie Bones was, was a crazy, uh, crazy techno guy. Let me look up, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of tricks that uh, that uh, Frankie Bones did. Let me, let me see. So what Frankie Bones used to do, he, he would carry two tracks of the same around. This is on vinyl, so he would play a track and then he would have another copy of that track. And because the mixers were like big, like chunky, long faded, useless pieces of shh, um, he, would, he would do the effects as we know right now on the mixer, so I'm just going to pull this one up for you. So this, uh, this would be two records at the same time, which would cause a little bit of phase. So that's some uh, live, uh, live uh, pioneer effectsing that we used to do like at the end of the 90s. And this is where I think Pioneer developed their, their delays and stuff on. So 
We used to do that with vinyl, and it was such a revelation. Um, so more techno names for me. Dave Clark, same story. Oh, man. So Dave Clark, you guys know Dave Clark, right? No? Yes? Yes? No? No techno people here. A few. So yeah, Dave Clark is uh, one of my main inspirations, and he, he gets like uh, DMC crazy on the faders. So what, what, what his trick was, and what I stole from him, <laughs> So he, he, he would have like these uh, really long techno loops going on, just like uh, 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 uh. And then just when you thought it was kind of boring, let me... He, he would just start cutting it up. which made techno uh, less boring back in the day. Um, <laughs> it's a shame that a lot, a lot of techno people like, forgot about that as well. So now it's just like mixing, mixing, mixing. Uh, Jeff Mills, obviously, uh, he introduced me to three-deck uh, mixing, which I used to do when I uh, played techno as well. Three vinyl decks. Um, you know, and, and you could have like loops going, you could have an acapella, you could have three uh, decks at the same time. Um, yeah, so those are my influences, basically, and that's why I, I trick as much as I do, because it's just so much fun. Um, so um, the way I started is very small as well. I uh, started playing smaller clubs, being like an unknown guy. I would play like, you know, 10 people, 70 people, 200 people. Um, and it was always the challenge of, like, okay, so at the end of my set, will they be happy? Will they be inspired? Will they come back to me and tell me, like, oh, dude, your set was amazing. Like, this was my motivation to, to, to DJ. Um, so this is kind of a mindset you need to keep in mind. So when you see all the festivals and the confetti and the fireworks, actually, we, we are still doing the same thing. So we want to convince the crowd that, you know, um, we can really play awesome music. Um, so, but it's very important to, to come up in that from, from small to big because you know how to, how to adapt the crowd and how to, to, to get the crowd going for, for you. So my first breakthrough gig in the Netherlands was uh, Awakenings back in, I think it was 2000 or 1999. I had the closing slot. I had been in an Awakenings um, visitor for a while and finally I got the chance to close it off. This was 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the morning, the last slot. And I knew what I wanted to hear as the crowd, being, being in the crowd, so I figured I, I would just play what I would love to hear. Um, so I played, I tore the roof, roof off, and when I finished, people were actually climbing up, up, until, uh, up until the DJ booth, asking me what my DJ name was. So, I remember this was my big opportunity, and I totally went for it, and after that, I could DJ in the Netherlands. And um, this is a kind of mind state that you need to have every time you perform, give it your all, um, and do your best to convince people. So this is a bit, a bit about my history, so where I came from. So what I want to share with you is a proper preparation of your DJ set. So, with preparation, it doesn't mean you should lay out every track you want to play in that exact order. You know, for all you know, um, Zombie Nation might be the track that uh, was the most cheesiest in the country ever and people cannot hear it. So if you have Zombie Nation in your lineup and you, and you see something is going wrong, you're screwed. So what do you do next? So for me, um, I see my tracks, my selection as a deck of cards. And this is why I never play the same set. So I, I have my new tracks, I have my to-go to tracks, and what I do is I just shuffle, you know, if I see something's working, 
The crowd likes it. Okay, so, okay, then I can go to that track and that track. Um, there's a very important thing about combinations that I want you to know, because as a DJ, it's very easy. Okay, okay so, for instance, um, I, I, I'll play ping pong by Hardwell, and then I'll mix it into Tremor, for instance, so like an easy combo. Hey, this is working for me. Let's do that at tomorrow's gig, and the gig after, and that gig after, and that gig after. Uh, you should make it a little bit harder on yourself. So what my golden combination is, if I have ping pong and I have tremor, and I want to go from ping pong to tremor, I will need to pick out a new track to get there. So every single set I do that, I'm like, oh, ping pong, ping pong, tremor, oh, wait. Okay, so now I'm going to play an Umed Oscon track in between. Okay, then go into tremor. Uh, next day, ping pong, ping pong, Oh, wait, so then I'll, I'll just take like um, the new Tiesto track and squeeze it in between and then go into Tremor. So this means your set will always vary. So it's a nice, uh, nice little challenge uh, for combinations. Um, what's very important to me is um, whenever I have a, a folder of new tracks that I put them in categories. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but uh, so I have everything in genres. You can, um, so for instance, I have a big room folder, a Dutch folder, fidget, filter disco, future house, jacking, techno, whatever. So it's very important to me to be playing little sections of every genre. So sometimes, or most of the time nowadays, I see DJs playing a dubstep track into a big room track, into a Melbourne track, into a hip hop break, into, and it doesn't make sense like as a crowd to dance to, but even as a listener, you're, that's confusing. You know, I thought I was going to an Italian restaurant, but then why are you serving me sushi? So, and then after the sushi, you're serving me Indian food. So what, what is that about? So what I want to do is have like 15 to 20 minutes of the same type of, same type of style going on. And it depends. So if, you're, if you have a crowd, say you're an Australian crowd and you love Melbourne music, okay, then I'll play like 35 minutes of Melbourne. After the 35 minutes, I'll have a look at you and then I'm thinking, oh, they want more. Okay, let's do a couple of more. And then switch back to another genre. So what I often see is DJs dropping like, like a hip-hop track out of nowhere, nowhere, which is great. But the most important thing with that is your timing. So when are you going to do that? So that's the question. You cannot do that out of the blue. So whenever I hear DJs doing that out of the blue, I'm thinking, no, you don't, you don't know what you're doing. You're just doing that because you think that's a big old school hit and you think that will work. You should do it when everyone's fed up of you playing EDM, Melbourne, whatever. So after a, a Melbourne section of 35 minutes, squeeze one more in, crowd is really bored, oh, everyone's kind of like wanting a drink now or going to the bar, then drop the hip-hop track. And don't drop one hip-hop track, drop, drop three, you know, because we're, we're doing it in sections. So this really works, I can tell you from experience, and this will really get the crowd, uh, crowd going. So it's a kind of a human psychology as well. Um, Again, I remember speaking, speaking to Dead Mouse about this, about the magic of DJing. And he's basically, you're just a button pusher. But pushing a button is the same as saying sex, sorry for the kids in here, sex is only an up and down motion. There's a lot of things involved there. The, there's magic in sex. There's magic in DJing as well. Um, and all these little things I'm telling you will help you create like a, a magical set and a magical experience. Um, so another, another important thing about prepping is knowing your equipment. I've seen and experienced a lot of professional DJs who make a lot of crazy money come up to me after my set and say like, Dude, my auto cue is off. Can you, can you put it on? And I'm, I'm here on the floor, 
thinking, shouldn't you know how these things work? So it's super, super important just for you to not be nervous on stage, that you know your equipment through and through. Just know everything about it. And, you know, there's about, I don't know, 20 features, 15 features on a CDJ. Just take one afternoon, maybe four hours, and, oh, what's this button for? What's this option? And then you're safe. You don't want to be on like an ultra main stage and thinking, oh my God, what's happening? I don't know what this button is for. And, oh, there's a crowd and I need to go on. No, you don't want that. Be prepared. Know your equipment. Um, Another, another thing is uh, usually the monitoring um, on stage or in a club sucks. So it's, uh, you know, the little box over here on the floor that's the, where the DJ uh, gets to listen uh, to his set to. Most of the time they suck. And they are different from your bedroom. So when you come out of the bedroom, you practice, oh, you're really good, oh, that's great. I remember my first radio gig. So this is my headphone ear. So my listening ear is this one. So in my bedroom, I had my speaker over there. So I came to the radio, I was fully prepared. I had like, you know, all the tracks set up and everything, I could scratch, whatever. And then the, the speaker was over there. <laughs> and I started mixing and I couldn't mix because the sound was like, oh, whoa, whoa wait, what? Oh, and that, that was a really bad experience. So what I started to do after that was just swapping my monitor speaker in my studio or in my bedroom to here. And then the other day over here. And then, you know, over there in that corner, I would put my decks here and my mixer here. So you, you can be prepared for any type of situation when you come to the club and not be like too surprised by how things go. Um, what I also did back in the day was a lot of, lot of um, recording my sets in my bedroom. So every night I would record an hour of me mixing. And then in the morning I would listen back to it critically. Just like listening where I could improve. I remember my first uh, mixtapes and I would put them on in the morning and my girlfriend would say, Oh, you mixed this, right? Because she heard so many mistakes, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's me. And I promised myself that I would practice that much that she wouldn't be able to recognize, like, DJ Remy's set and my set. And then after, she would say, oh, you mixed this, right? And I was like, no, this is DJ Remy. So, you know, um, that really helped me, just to listen to your own sets and then you can listen to the combinations that work for you. Oh, this track with this track. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I think the dance floor will, will be, uh, be very happy to hear that kind of combination. Because um, speaking about combinations, there's this discussion that I had in Miami with the sick individuals. Uh, one of the, uh, the individuals uh, is here. I think the other one is sick. And... Um, <laughs> And um, no, it's, it's all good, it's all good. I'm always open to have like a really good discussion uh, about DJing. These guys are producers and they, they tackle this, like many, many producing DJs, uh, as a producer kind of deal. So for them, it's very important to do mixed in key. Um, for me, it's not. So I'm, I'm like a real old school um, DJ, I don't want to say dummy, but DJs back in the days weren't producers, so they were like, ah, we don't care about mixing key. Mixing key I use for my podcasts, for instance. If you want to have something seamless in the air, you just do mixing key. What I do, is, and that's most important to me, is mix on elements. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of the same as genre, uh, but elements is like, okay, so what's in the track? So I'm gonna mix two tracks, and then I want one of you to tell me what similarities it is and why I mix the tracks together. So, um, here we go. I'm, I'm gonna mix quick, okay? Uh,
All right, so who's gonna tell me? Yeah, okay, Mr. Mr. Individual, he, he recognized it, so holler. Drums. Yeah, so it's like the, the tribally drum in there. That's the same. And you know what, it's really cool. They're like in my, uh, what I call fluffy big room folder, which is all like Axwell and Alesso and Otto knows. But these two particular tracks have the same type of drums. So within the genre, you have tracks that are similar that you can mix. And that will make it like a, a seamless transition. Um, so, you know, uh, back when, uh, when Epic came out, for instance, I played like three or four Epic type of tracks. Animals was in there too, um, because it's similar. And so you have something you really like dancing to as a crowd, and then the other track is another one you like, really like dancing to. So that, that's how I roll, basically. And what I, what's very important with me is that I see tracks as little packets of energy. So I remember this coming in very useful if I would be, when I was an opening DJ, I would stack the energy. So what you can easily do is just label a track energy number one. That's like the, you know, so energy, energy number one would be maybe like, um, you know, techno stuff, techno stuff, techno stuff. Here we go. Um, ah. For sure, energy number one. So. So that's, you know, relax. Okay, so you're just warming up. Energy number two. Okay, let me see if I can uh, get some out of the same folder here. Um, energy number two, let me, let me see. So you can tell the energy is a little bit more intense than the other track. So from here you could go into like any future house track, which would be energy level three. Um, then more, uh, fidget. Energy number four, um, you know, you can go into, so, and then at the end you can end up like with hard style or, or before that like EDM or any tremor kind of track. But so then you can stack your set. Oh, I wanted a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit less, a little bit less, oh, way less. And it's very important because what I think the dance floor is all about is about energy. People doing this, or people doing that, people doing this. Um, and so if you, if you can figure out the energy in a track, then you can like open, open your sets, but you can, you can play peak time sets, but without even being like, you know, a commercial hoe about it. You can be like, I have a folder that, uh, that says uh, rage, rage fast. So whenever I'm in front of a younger crowd, I'll just like open up the folder and it's like all like, ah, bsh, ah, bsh. three, two, one, jump. Um, so whenever I play, I have this cloud of tracks that's, um, that's in my head. And uh, this is something Ronald Molendijk used to say. Ah. Ronald Molendijk, a legend of uh, Rotterdam. Um, he would say, I'm always thinking about three or four tracks ahead. So me too. So how I'm able to switch that fast through tracks is because I already have a picture of where I'm going in my sets. Um, so one of the nastier things of when I'm performing is I don't like people around me, and especially when they tap me on the shoulder while, while I'm playing, this little cloud is gone. I'm like, oh. Um, I don't know what to play next. And um, this cloud is very important just to, okay, so I'm playing this track, but I want to go there, and I need that acapella, and I'm go gonna go here, and then you can switch up, switch it up really quick quickly. And I think this might be, this is something I do naturally, might be my key uh, to being able to mix that fast, is to just know what, what I, where I want to go and what I want to play. 
So sometimes in a crowd you get kids that are, okay, so I'm, I'm uh, playing this track. And then they want to hear a Chucky uh, beat of the drum. And I'm like, uh, wait a second, that's not possible. So I could never in my life drop Chuck, Chucky's beat of the drum after this. So I'll need to, I'll need to morph in that. So how, how do I do that? So that's where the energy levels come in. So you, you take another track and maybe a track with like a tribally beat, then maybe just a track with like some ravey synths, and then I go into beat of the drum, because then it's like a flow. And then people can uh, still dance to it. So a lot of times with real DJing, it's manipulation as well. It's as if you're trying to get your ex-girlfriend to talk to you again. It's like, hey, how are you doing? Like, you know, you don't really care about that, right? Can we go out to eat again? And it's like, you just wheel, wheel and weave your way into where you want to go with it. So to me, that's very important about DJing as well. Um, so yeah, as I said, I could, I, could, I could go on rambling about DJ technique. I will get to DJ technique soon. But a very, very, very important thing about DJing that's missed nowadays is the trend setting and the taste making. Back in the day, DJs would be these awesome guys that would have records that no one had. And they would be spinning it and you were like, but what record is he playing? I want to have this record. And then you would look on the vinyl and they would have it like stickered off so you couldn't see the title. It was mad frustrating. But dude, those guys had awesome tracks. And what I want to say is that although it's very easy and tempting to play the Beatport Top 100 or Top 10, you shouldn't. <laughs> although the crowd wants to hear it, it's very important to go and dig into the 3,000 tracks that are coming out a week and find your own special secret weapon in there. Uh, Benny Rodriguez. Who knows Benny Rodriguez? Rotterdam. Ah, more. Okay, so he, he uh, worded it really good for me. He's like, it's not about the hits you play, because everyone can play the hits. It's about what you play in between the hits that will mark you as an artist and that will give you uh, the ability to stand out. Taste making. Taste making is super important. And you are in charge of what your style wants to be. Do you want to be the... Do you want to be like a fake Hardwell or do you want to be like a fake Dimitri and like Mike and play their set? Or do you want to be you? You want to stand out. So think about that. It's very important to develop your own taste in music. Um, I sometimes get really hurt when I post up my top 10 on my Facebook and people say, but wait, this track is number one on Beatport. Why isn't it in there? Because I think it sucks. So if I think it sucks, I won't play it. And that's the mentality of like an old school DJ. You should, um, you should really keep that in mind. Taste making. Um, so another super important thing is to feel out the crowd. It's a kind of like a spacey kind of term. So what is it, feeling out a crowd? How, how can you feel out a crowd when you're behind the, deck, uh, the, the decks? And how do you do that? So it's very simple. It's about uh, monitoring the energy in a room. So, you know, when you see the crowd jump, it's usually a good sign. Or, you know, if they, uh, if they go and get a drink, that's usually a bad sign. And, you know, if, if you're playing something that you think, ah, oh, this will work, and no one is putting their hand up, that's a bad sign. So these are all like concrete things you can notice if your set is not working, or, or, or if it is. Um, you know, people coming up to you like this, <laughs> or this, that's usually a bad sign. Um, and so where do you switch to? So, you know, if you... I, I, I had this once, it was a big, major screw-up. Um, I only noticed in the middle of my set, I was playing in a techno club. And this was right after I dropped my remix for Black Eyed Peas. And everyone ran away. And there were a couple of these ones in the crowd as well. And I was like, oh, man. And then I realized I needed to start playing techno. And so I did. 
and you know, I, I saved the, uh, what was left of it. Um, but if you can nail that, if you can see what the crowd wants, if you can see where the energy is going, then you can take this energy and take it to another level. And then you can make nights that are unforgettable. If you and the crowd are like a unity, if you see what's going on, um, then you can nail it. Um, and this is very important um, when, when talking about prepared sets, prepared uh, track lists. I could never do that. I did that with my live performance where I took all my producer gear, you know, uh, tackled it like an artist, had a set list, and I remember dropping, dropping a new track and I knew this wasn't going to work for this type of crowd. And I slapped myself in my face, I felt, felt captured. I knew what track to play, I, I just couldn't. Um, so yeah, it's super important to know what track you can play in place of that, you know? What can I do to catch the crowd? So this is one of the big mysteries of DJing and a really nice game to always be playing. Whenever I'm in a club or whenever I'm at a festival, it's always a, a game of catch. Can I catch you? Can I catch you? Can I catch you? I see you not dancing, what do I need to play? I see them not dancing. Um, where am I? Oh, this is, uh, this is Brazil. They don't like Latin house here. Oh, okay. Switch back. So, and it's, it's very exciting. If you can nail it, then it's the best feeling ever. If you can't, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're here, uh, we're here on, we ended up on the DJ technique. So now I can show you a little bit on how I uh, DJ and how I do live mashups, for instance. Um, what I prefer is, is to mix a cappellas live. I don't really like playing uh, mashups of tracks with an a cappella because, okay, so I'll, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna do this. I'm just gonna play a track. I'm gonna pretend, okay, so we're in Utrecht and uh, today we're in Utrecht. This is day one and I'm gonna play this track. Um, so, thank you, thank you. To me, this is very normal. So, to me, it's very abnormal that you would play this a cappella stuck on the track. Because day two in Utrecht, I might just do this. So, thank you. So, you know, day three in Utrecht, etc. cetera. Um, and it just leaves room for a lot of flexibility. I mean, I could like screw around and fool around with, with the vocal. I don't need to. I mean, I think it's fun to do so. Um, 
But that for me is way more exciting than to just like play it safe and you know mash it up with like something that's just like if you press play. So um, same goes for another type of mashup, which which I'm going to show you right now. Let me just like do it randomly because sometimes people ask me they were like, oh this mashup you played of this and that track. And I'm like, no, that, that wasn't the mashup. That was just like me mixing. Um, let, me, let me just find a, find a good, good track to mash this one up for you. Oh, yeah, OK, I can do this. OK, so again, day one in Utrecht. And I'm, I'm just going to show you that it's super, super, super simple to not like prepare your mashups. And it's just so easy. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna go here. So, okay, I'll show you. Let's see. So there was a different drop than, than originally planned. So I basically just, that's why I have four decks as well. Sometimes I have an acapella running or another track I want to mix. And then this one would be the new drop. So it's very simple. It's on a cue point. That's going to be the new drop. And when this one hits, I'm just going to press play. That's, e that's as easy. And a lot of professional DJs get so nervous about that. So let me do day two in Utrecht. <laughs> Same story. And, you know, I really, on purpose, make it look that easy, because it is, and I wish more DJs would do it. OK, same story. So here we go, day two, Utrecht. And then you'd expect this drop, but So why the hell can't you do this live? This is so easy, right? I could do day three in Utrecht. We have a different drop again. And you can like vary on and on. So when I say my, my tracks are like a deck of cards, they are. We can just shuffle. We can have fun with it. You know, don't be worried. Of course, if you will try it for the first time, you know, you'll have the climax. You'll have the climax and coming out of it, you're like, okay, so this is ready, this is ready. Crowd, crowd, okay, uh, everything good, everything good. Yeah, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna press play, I'm gonna press play. Here we go, yeah. Oh. The fader wasn't on. So, you don't wanna do that on like ultra main stage. So, it's important you practice, but it's relatively really simple. So that's just like live mashup stuff. Um, I'm going to show you what I do with every track. I program three cue points. Um, basically, it's the first drop, no, the first break, the first drop, and maybe the second break or the second drop. So this is uh, the Alvaro and uh, Lil John. Welcome to the jungle. Oh, this is fun too. So I, nowadays, I program it on the, on the snares. I'm going to do another live mashup for you, because that's fun. Um, uh, lovers, 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 lovers of, on the sun. And I'm going to play the original. So I have a, I have a cue point here. So again, this mashup doesn't exist. Uh, this is just mixing. So, etc. So I have a little li little loopy program here that goes on the end of the of the vocal, and then you can go into the snare I program.
So that's fun. That's just having fun. So if you program like your cue points, have a little bit of like a con conceptual idea with it, you can just like play around endlessly, and it's great. Maybe that's why I'm always smiling when I'm DJing. I'm just like having fun. It's um, it's addicting. Um, so yeah, you know there there are tons of tricks. What I sometimes or what I used to do is just like steal tricks from people. So you know if I if I heard someone play something new and did a new trick, I was like, whoa, I wanna just. Welcome to the jungle pass. So this, uh, this one used to be uh, the Benny Rodriguez. Endlessly. Um, like this is the Gesaffelstein. Uh, this is my uh, bad boy Bill scratch which is fun too, like an old school US kind of thing. So the cool thing about scratching is, so you, you could hear the, the vocal screwing up and, and then everyone on YouTube is saying, ha ha ha, fail, laid back Luke, fail, you see? Um, <laughs> like laid back, laid back Luke cannot DJ, uh, and so, um, but you can see, then you can save it. So. So learning to scratch is, is, is actually not about like, oh man, look at me scratching, oh, I'm like awesome, because there's always someone that can scratch better than you. But learning to scratch will give you security for when something goes wrong. This is why you actually still need to learn to beat match, because if a track is off, you're on ultra main stage, you don't know which way to push, like, okay, so that's like a very stressful and nervous situation. You want to be strong, you want to be like, oh, I can handle that, that's easy. Oh, this goes wrong? Screw it, I'm just going to do this. And that's a, like a really cool feeling to have. So I can recommend everyone just to like, go into like, the various things you can do with tracks. So don't rely on just the mashup, playing the mashup, spraying champagne, standing on the DJ booth. But go and dive a little bit deeper, play with acapellas, play with drops, live mashups. It's so fun. It's so much more fun than standing on the DJ booth. Are you kidding me? Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, what I think is, is very good for you to know that when you come out of your bedroom and you're super nervous of playing in front of a crowd, and I know this feeling. The first two years that I um, started to DJ, throughout the week, I had the feeling that someone was going to kill me in the weekend. I woke up every morning with, in Dutch, klamme handjes. And, <laughs> and it was horrible. And then when I came to the club, we had vinyl, and I needed to put the, like, the first track on the, on the... And I just dropped the needle somewhere, and then just spun it back, and... Okay, so... These are the nerves that all of us know. Oh, another nice quote. I remember talking to Alesso like two years ago, and he was about to go on in um, Brazil. It was Creamfields, Brazil. Main stage, I think, did I? I think I played before him, or I even I needed to play after him. And he was so nervous. He was like drinking, and he was like, he was talking to me. He was like, Luke, how do you do that? And I'm like, well, how long have you been DJing? And he was like, half a year. And I'm like, well, you know, I've been DJing for over 12 now. Like, um, you know. So 
When you come out of your bedroom, you're the next Martin Garrix. You're like amazing. And you're gonna go on ultra main stage, just pretend you're in your bedroom. So you're on the stage, you see this crowd, and just by looking here, you should go back to your bedroom, thinking, you know, I love this. I do this every day. I like mixing. Nothing is different. And then you'll get into it. And then you could see the crowd, and hey, the crowd is going for it. And if I put one hand up, other people are going to put my hand up. This is fun. Like, oh, okay, hey, hey, ho, hey. And then you can have some fun with it. So just, just keep that in the back of your mind. It, it'll really help. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm about to round this one off. Um, just just want to touch down on saying that, you know, the, the tour life isn't that easy as you think. This will be like a whole different seminar. But, I mean, it looks great on the Instagram and it looks, you know, like, oh, like, oh, crowd is over there. Um, there's a lot of flight, ask the individual. Uh, there's a lot of flights, there's a lot of uh, stress. You always need to perform. Um, man, if you're drinking, there's no time for a hangover. Uh, you're in different time zones. You don't get to see your friends and family. I'm not moaning, I'm just warning you. So it's great, it's really great, and we're super lucky we can do this on, on, this, uh, on this scale. And especially being DJs from the Netherlands, we have a, like an open entrance to like, be on top of the world. But just be prepared, it's not easy. And be prepared to actually, what I want everyone to realize is try and live as healthy as you can and then perform and then you're amazing. Um, but that's another seminar. So um, I'm finishing off with, uh, with a quote of Sting and this is, this is what I always perform by. Um, the quote of Sting is, every single performance I do, I just pretend it's the last one ever. So this will make you play the best set you want, you can, always. So this is what I do on a daily basis as well. It's just to get that passion going and to just give it your all every single day. So this uh, rounds my seminar off. <laughs> Questions? What? Yeah. Heb je zelf wel tijd om al je cues in gekke post te zetten? Of wordt dat voor je gedaan? Of heb je... Nee, 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 dat moet ik zelf doen. En dat heb ik het liefst ook zelf. Want dan kom ik ook op de ideeën. Should, should we do this in English? Yeah, of course. Oh, no. um, so, yeah, I, I myself do my uh, setting up my cues. It's, it's a little bit of a pain in the A. But um, it'll give me like a concepts and ideas of where I can go with the drops, where I can go with the climaxes. Uh, so it's actually good if you keep doing that yourself. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? What are your views on like software DJing? Like other than like if you say you don't use sync but you're 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 just using it as a tool. Yeah. Do you find that fake or what is your views on it? Oh, that's a really good question. I didn't even touch base on that. Uh, so the the essence of DJing is actually the essence of electronic music is new technology. And so I am always open for new technology. And, you know, I think if it's done well, then I have no problem with, like, DJing on Ableton. But there's a lot of professional DJs out there that, that come from a producer corner, start DJing with Ableton, do everything in mix and key, and I'm just thinking, this doesn't make sense. Like, you know, the way things are mixed, the way the flow is of the set, it's, it's not, it doesn't have that magic I was talking about. Um, then, if you can DJ in Ableton, and if you have the free time to, to not worry about pitching, then why the hell are you on the DJ booth? So, play a sixth track, play a seventh track, do something surprising, mix every five seconds, do something out of the box. So, you know, it could be way better than what's going on right now. Uh, how old were you when you had your first gig? <laughs> Yeah, so actually I started as a producer first. So I started producing when I was uh, 15. Uh, this was in 1992. Um, but later on, I started getting into DJing. So I had my first show at the age of 20, I think, um, in 1997. Um, so I'm a producer first, 
and then a DJ actually. Here. Um, I had a question. If, if you're starting off as a producer or a DJ, uh, you mainly have a style, and maybe that's EDM, which is kind of heavy style. And at your first gigs, you always get planned at the start of the evening. How do you handle that? Because you, you can't profile yourself as an EDM DJ in the beginning of the evening because you can't drop that hard. God, it's, it's so terrible there's like underage kids in there because I really want to compare DJing with sex. <laughs> <laughs> you guys close your ears and I'm just, I'm just going to do it anyway for the adults in here. So, what do you do at the beginning of a night with your girl? Yeah, <laughs> I, I get the point, but... You're just gonna whip out like the, the, the biggest dildo you have, and like, yeah, let's do this, yeah! <laughs> no, you take her out. You have a nice dinner. You have a nice night. Then you cuddle a little bit, you kiss a little bit, etc. So... What a good solution is, I, I did my fair shares of warming up for Roger Sanchez, I did like three hours warm up sets, is tease the crowd, so, you know, I would mix, 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 build, 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 and then I would just tease with a little bit of show me love, din, 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 and gone, build up, and so people know you can actually do this, but you are not doing it, and there's nothing better than a good warm up DJ, and the crowd feels it too. Yeah, I feel you, thank you. A uh, question, how you think about the DJ Mac the Pandavids? Because uh, I think you and Chucky are uh, more the uh, technical top DJs in top 10, maybe the best on the world, but now Hardware, Hardware also a very good DJ. But yeah, there are more DJs in top 100 that are not really technical. Well, thank you very much, I really appreciate that. Um, no, actually, you know, um, Sorry if I come across a little bit arrogant, but I sometimes compare it to Leonardo DiCaprio, who never won an Oscar. I think he's an amazing actor. I go and see every movie he makes. I think he's awesome. He doesn't need an award for that. And I think the same as well, you know. Um, I just enjoy what I do. I love what I do. I don't need an award for that. Um, so, you know, the DJ MAG Award, and I love Hardwell, God bless him. Love everyone that's at the, at the top. Um, but are they really at the top? Are they just really popular? So I once said that, you know, if I would get the, the number one spot, I would not agree to take it, because above me are Mixmaster Mike, DJ Qbert, A-Track, uh, screw it, guys like TJR. These guys are insane. I could never say, like, I'm better than you. I'm, like, number one, dude. Qbert. What? <laughs> Qbert. <laughs> So, you know, it's a tricky thing. I, I don't really rate it that much, to be honest. Hello. Uh, uh, a time ago, I was playing on a party, and um, the DJ boot was so hard, I didn't hear what I was doing. Do you ever had that pl problem? Oh, man, it was terrible. I remember back in the day, uh, when I first started out DJing, there was uh, someone of the government measuring the amount of decibels that I had coming out of my monitors. And I used to do a lot of uh, DJs like the regular Dutch DJs do, a uh, lot of shows, um, you know, for a night or whatever. So it was the end of the night. I was in Club Moore in Amsterdam and the, the DJ monitor was here and it was full on. It was, they measured, it was the pa pain, pain boundary of sound I was listening to. And I was here, I was like, I can't hear it. I can't hear it. Um, so it's terrible, actually. DJ monitors are really bad for, for your ears. They're not good. So this is one of the reasons I, I mix with in-ears. So this replaces the DJ monitor and gives me the perfect sound everywhere, always, in like big halls, big, big stages. I always have the same sound, and I have it turned down really nicely low, and I can hear everything perfectly. So yeah, you gotta take care of your ears, for sure. Um, I just wanna say that you're one of my inspirations and one of the pioneers. I still okay. remember when the Layback Luke Forum, like the first when you were helping people out before, it was now a fad with the artists. I just wanna say thank you to that. Oh, thank you. I had an off-topic question, though. Um, in regards to music distribution, I know that recently you released a track with Tujama. 
um, and you had the B-Port incident. Can you touch base with your idea? Your uh, thoughts on that is, because I know all of us are probably wondering. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind. I mean, I have nothing to hide. So, um, you know, basically, you see these uh, guys uh, uh, doing this, these actions like, uh, you know, so show me your receipt and you can win like a helicopter ride. Show me your receipt and you can win like headphones. And us at our record company thought we can take that next level, see how that works. So. You show us your receipt, we give you your money back. And that's pretty much it. And it generated us 30 extra sales of the 1100. And they kicked us out of the Beatport Top 10. So, you know, maybe we should hand out headphones next or like horse rides or whatever. Are there any more questions? One more? Yeah, so, so what is actually better about these in-ears um, than uh, just regular headphones? And, yeah. and how do you manage your, um, the level of uh, damage to, to your ears? Yeah. And have you any advice to, uh, to us? Okay, so there are a couple of uh, different styles of DJs. So m one of the DJs only listens to one ear and has the monitor here, so I'm one of those. Other DJs put the, the mass put the cue on the master and mix with two ears. If you're one of those, you shouldn't do in-ears. That's, you know, you're good. Your sound is good everywhere. You have the same sound. Doesn't matter if you're in a big hallway or not. So, but if you're one of these DJs, or these DJs, then I could recommend you to, to start DJing with, uh, with in-ears. So basically these damp as well, or not this one, the other ones I have, um, minus 20 dB. So you can put, put the, the volume really low, and you can just hear all the details. And it's perfect sound everywhere. OK, I think we should wrap it up. Or you have one last thing you need to share with us? No, I, no? I, I've never talked as much in my life <laughs> as, uh, as you did. You did well. Thank you. Um, give a big, big, big applause. And a thank you, Laidback Luke. Woo!